Good morning, fourth graders. Hi. Um, this is ELA, so this is going to be our reading and writing corner for fourth grade. So today we are reading The Monster Beneath the Sea, as you can see over here. At first, the first thing we always do whenever we start reading is that we look at our text. So I'm going to look at the pictures that are there. I see a green, looks kind of like a catfish to me. It's not a catfish, but it looks like catfish to me. So that's the inference I'm going to make. It's some type of fish. Okay, and I'm going to look through my other pages too. So I'm going to look at the pictures. So it looks like this fish is hitting something. I see that now there's broken stuff. So maybe he was like hitting the stuff that he broke. I'm not quite sure. Um, I see him. Oh, it's a man. Okay. So there's a fish and then there's like a man and clinging onto him. At first I thought the fish was wearing boots, but he's not wearing boots. Okay. Oh, and then there's a cool sign which has like no cars and a fish and I can't read it because I don't read Japanese. So we're going to go back. So the first thing we do whenever we see a new story is we need to look at the pages we're going to be reading. Sometimes our our pictures can give us evidence for what the story is going to be about. Sometimes it can help us make inferences or even um, clear up some misunderstandings that we don't even know we have yet. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to bring it over here. Okay. So the monster beneath the sea. Deep in the ocean off the coast of Japan lived... Bring this up. lived a catfish named Nazu. Like all catfish, Nazu didn't need to use his small eyes to find his way through the salty waters. He used his cat-like whiskers to sense the sea around him. With a flick of his tail, he was propelled whichever way he wanted to go. But Nazu was different from the other catfish of the Pacific Ocean in one important way. He was enormous! A monster-sized fish that lived alone in a rocky layer along the ocean floor. Nazu was so large that even the smallest flick of his tail caused giant waves to crash on the shore above and stirred earthquakes through the island of nation of Japan. When Nazu wiggled even just a tiny bit, the building in Japan rattled. Glass windows shattered. Shelves collapsed, scattering merchants' goods across the floors. Tea spilled. The very earth groaned and cracked. The people knew how to duck their heads and run for the shelter. No one was safe from Nazu. Sorry, no one was safe when Nazu shook his massive tail. Okay, so I'm going to pull us back out. So we just got done reading page 31. I noticed something. I'm not sure if you guys noticed it as well. So I know that Nazu is a catfish, and it explains he's going to be, I think, maybe something to do with the monster. I'm not sure if he is the monster. I don't know yet. And that he lives in like a rocky lair. Okay. And our setting is going to be Japan or like under Japan or like under the water in Japan. And that Nazu does something with his tail that makes people not feel safe. Can you guys think about what Nazu does with his tail? Let's go on to the next page. One day, a young artist was at his work table using a sharp chisel to create a word cut. He spent months crafting a detailed representation, sorry, representation of the capital city of Indu, where he lived. Painstakingly, he etched out shapes and lines of shops, buildings, and streets, and miniature people in an intricate design. The wood cut was nearly finished, ready to be covered with ink and pressed against a sheet of parchment. Very carefully, he sat his knife against the table, sorry, against the block for the final stroke. When far below the sea, Nazu decided it was time to stretch out and move around. The giant catfish inched along the deep, dark surface of the sea. Using his whiskers, he smelled and tasted the sea. He moved past a school of tuna and through a seaweed garden. Then near a long, rocky coral reef, Nazu raised his tail and smacked it against the ocean floor. 
Sand splattered. A whirl of water bubbled from the impact. With a boom and a bang, the crust of the earth crumbled. Oh, and I see that the picture now, if I look at the picture, is it showing the earth is like crumbling. So this is Nazu crumbling the earth. A crack expanded out from the place Nazu's tail slapped down and continued along the seafloor. Energy under the earth's crust built up until it was dangerously stressed and then it exploded. The entire island of Japan shook violently as the ground quaked. The earthquake knocked over the artist's work table, toppling his tools to the ground. The chisel he'd been using to carve a tiny pagode slipped, leaving a deep, jagged scratch across the small wood of small square of wood. The artist looked at his wood block. It was runned. So there's some words I wanted to point out in here. So chiseled, right? Chiseled is um, a word we've learned in Mary Anning, if you guys remember. Chiseled is kind of like a instrument that you use to make like marks into marks into like the wood or like, well, the wood in here or like into the sand and stuff. And the other thing is pagode is actually like a tiny like building. We have one in Point Defiance. So it's just like a little structure that he was making. Okay, so let's read the next page. Oh, and here, the, here's the chisel right there. Look at that. Tears filled his eyes. This was not the first time a swish of Nazu's tail had caused a quake that destroyed his work. Broken bits of broken bits of block littered the workshop floor. The artist closed his eyes and sighed. He did not want to start over again. In that moment, he decided to quit and give up his dream of becoming an accomplished artist who would have his work displayed in every home and shop throughout Japan. He would look for a more practical job, one that would not be affected by Nazu's many quakes. Perhaps he should become a bricklayer, repairing the buildings that were constantly toppling down. As the artist began to pack his tools into a canvas bag, he heard commotion outside on the street. He left his studio to discover that people were gathering in the town's center square. <clears throat> we must do something about Nazu, the baker said. His jacket was covered with spilled rice flour dust and splattered with frosting. I agree. A woman came from the sea ceremony house, carrying pieces of an ornate broken kettle and shards of ruined teacups. Behind her, parents, children, bankers, sh chefs, and merchants gathered. The entire town was uniting for an important meeting. This has gone on too long, the baker said, standing before the assembly. We must call upon Keshmi to help us. A hush settled over the crowd. No one made a sound. Keshmi is too busy to handle this matter, a woman said, as she cradled a small baby in her arms. He is the god of martial arts and must oversee dojos. Sorry, oversee the dojos. Dojos were training centers for students learning karate, judo, and samurai. So, I wanted to point out here that this is a context clue, right? This is a definition context clue because it says um, he is the god of martial arts and must oversee the dojos. But then it explains right after that sentence, so dojos were the training centers for the students learning karate, judo, and samurai. So my question is, did you catch it? We're going to pause now and I'm going to make the second part of this video.